uh, this event. And this morning, uh, we are so grateful to be joined by John Vestal, who's an appraiser that I've personally known for about 20 years. Uh, we were chatting this morning, honestly, I can vividly remember in like 2002, 2003, when appraisers would hand deliver their reports and uh, him coming into the office and, uh, and delivering those. And I got to know John during that time and have, have just uh, grown with him as he's grown as well. So seriously, thank you so much for Thank you for having me, Jeff. It's great to be here. This is about the third or fourth time I've spoken to a group of realtors. This is a little bit different. Uh, before, it's been in a live audience with a lot of back and forth. So this is a little bit of an adjustment, having the, <laughs> having the Zoom technology. But thanks for having me. What do, what do I do with my hands? <laughs> um, no, we're going to have some fun. So, so do real quick, before we jump in, uh, tell, tell if I wouldn't mind you sharing with everybody, right. how in the world did you get into it? I mean, I'm sure you weren't you know, graduating college and be like, God, no. I want to be an appraiser. I actually went to the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. I uh, became a pharmacist. I practiced retail pharmacy for 13 years. Hmm. Got a little burned out and had a good friend here in Charlotte hmm. who was an appraiser. And um, I started interviewing with some pharmaceutical companies and he said, hey, why don't you just come work with me? So I've been doing that. I've been doing this about 23 years. I never look back. It's been a great profession. I love doing it. Um, I love the the freedom of working out of the house sure. or uh, what have you. But um, yeah, um, again, this is like the third or fourth time I've spoken to a group of realtors. Uh, this is going to be a little bit different. I know t today they want to know why so many appraisals are coming in below <laughs> uh, market value. So we'll definitely jump into that. But yeah. um, that's kind of my background. Yeah. Cool. We're, we're trying to protect you a little bit, you know, by doing it via <laughs> Zoom this way. Right. So you can't throw any tomatoes everybody. or anything out <laughs> Uh, pure frustration. But anyway, um, all right. So here, here's the deal. Like I know from a lending standpoint, the, the, you know, we're held certain standards and I know real estate agents are as well. And it's, you know, and it's and quite simply, if we're not abiding by the rules, if we're not doing things of, of, you know, the right way, there's, there's ramifications involved. You know, we could lose our license. We could get it suspended. Right. We could have, you know, it revoked and that's our ability to provide for our families. So, uh, I would love to start this whole thing with, would you mind sharing, like, is there a governing body for you? How, you know, do yep. you have to answer to somebody with your work? We have to answer to a couple of entities. Uh, first and foremost, the North Carolina Appraisal Board. Every state has an appraisal board. It operates in the same capacity as your North Carolina, I think it's called the Real Estate Commission. Yep. Um, they handle licensing, uh, renewals, education, uh, complaints, disciplinary action. So, um, they're more reactive than proactive. They don't have the manpower to go out and actively seek out bad appraisers or bad appraisals. Um, they kind of wait until complaints are filed sure. and then they do take them very seriously and uh, investigate uh, those to the full extent. Um, I think from an appraiser standpoint, more, the more liability comes from Fannie Mae. It's a bigger organization. They have the technology and the means and the, and the desire to um, maybe weed out bad appraisers. Yeah. Um, and th this really came about after the financial crisis of 2009. They actually revised their form, made it more uniform so that they can scan every report for irregularities. And you know, if, you, if Fannie Mae determines you're overvaluing appraisals, you know, they can blacklist <clears throat> you. Yeah. And I can tell you, if you get blacklisted from Fannie Mae, you're not gonna be, you might as well find another <laughs> career. career. So I'm not saying appraisers have any more uh, pressures or liabilities yeah. than any other um, profession, but you know, those are out. Yeah, no, that, yeah. I think it's important to know that because for those that are on this call that were not in the business prior to the crash, uh, it, it was, you know, some people call it the wild, wild west, I kid you not. <laughs> Uh, there were there were loan officers and real estate agent and appraisers that that really they were like, hey, we need this value, we need X, and so we would be in touch with the appraiser at that point. We could communicate to the appraiser, hey, we need this value, and so the the appraiser could go and be like, hey, well, look, there's nothing on the immediate subdivision that could support that, not even close, but I can go a little bit further down to this subdivision or that subdivision, and there's comps that'll support that. Well, then they would bring the home in that value. Now deal's closed, buyer gets the house, seller gets the money, everybody's happy, we're rocking. Well, then when the crash happened, the, the, the banking system said, what the heck happened? How can we allow, like, how can we prevent this from happening again? And the remedy was they came up with third-party appraisal management companies. So now 
lenders have to have a third party appraisal management company where we send the order to them they will assign it to a local appraiser in the in the area right. that appraiser does the report sends it back to the appraisal management company so there's no communication at all involved it's almost like you're like an endangered species like nobody yeah. can chat with you nobody can talk to you but uh, but it's it's been a way to try and address that issue so it's extremely um you, you explained it very well and i think it got the appraisal management concept got a lot of pushback from yeah. a lot of people at first but now that it's in place um i think it's an excellent idea yeah yeah i mean it it does so let's talk about appraisal so okay. um you know this is a hot topic i'm around this we all are right and and it's like you know especially from an appreciation standpoint with homes that are hidden especially if there are certain pockets that are in our markets that are appreciating 10, 15, 20% year to date. I've never seen this in the 20 years I've been in the business. You know, how do you account for this on an appraisal? Is it a line item? Is it a time adjustment? Is there a comfort level? Uh, you know, when you're trying to make line item, line item adjustments for this thing. So uh, one of the questions that a real estate agent asked Lee Bryant, she asked, how do you take into an account appreciation trends in an area? And how would you advise realtors to consider that when pricing a home to sell? I thought that was a fantastic question. Yeah, and there, there's a lot of uh, questions in there or things to address. First of all, yes, there is a date of sale time adjustment on our standard appraisal form, which we refer to as a 1004. I'm sure you've all seen one. Um, it's used in times like these when you see a lot of appreciation or de de depreciation. Um, we typically make an adjustment to any home that had closed or any comparable that's closed over 90 days. Um, and we base that on the rate of appreciation. Okay. Right now, <clears throat> I think the latest Case-Shiller index number I saw was that in the Charlotte market area, uh, homes have appreciated 13% wow. year over year. <laughs> um, what makes this a little different is that it seemed it, to me, uh, home prices jumped overnight, yeah. 10%. I don't know the exact date, maybe February. Yeah. And that's why that's what makes it so hard for that's why I think that so many appraisals came in below contract price is because the system we have in place and that we've had been we've had in place for decades, we use trailing 12 month data. Yeah. So I always use my arm as a prop for those visual <laughs> learners out there. But let's say we're in a market where home prices are uh, appreciating. We're appraising a house today. Yep. If we're using comps in the past. Theoretically, you can't ever support yeah today's uh value yeah um it's easier when the rate of appreciation is low four to five percent when it's higher it's going to be harder and that's why we're seeing uh, more appraisals uh come in below uh, market or contract price um we're going to get into you know multiple offers uh, i know it's hard i know that doesn't help you with your frustration out there but um you know uh, was I gonna say? It's a tough. It's yeah, a it's, yeah. it's a tough thing to to nail down, especially when you're when they're when a, the appraisal board is asking you to go back twelve months, and like you know, so there's just that fine line. It seems like it's challenging to right. And it, it really does. It's not the appraisal board. It's more of the Fannie, Fannie May, okay, and, and FHA underwriting guidelines. Got so it. They want certain things uh, bracketed. Okay. And I think a recent question came in this morning about uh, can we talk about um, can the appraised value ever be higher then the unadjusted values of the comparables, and the answer is no. Uh, hmm. The underwriter is always going to want to see one sale that has sold for more mm -hmm. than our final opinion of value. Hmm. Um, Interesting. So that, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, how do you take into account, like on, this is a, um, a, a great question uh, from Kelly Smith, in a current environment with homes going 30 to 80 grand over asking, uh, you know, would you consider neighborhood trends of, of homes? Are, you know, are you allowed to, you know, what are some, uh, you know, where are where neighborhoods we and I've seen it where they're so desirable homes in that neighborhood are selling, you know, literally thirty thousand to eighty thousand dollars over list price. Uh, you know, how do you deal with that? Well, again, the simple answer is we do we deal with the best we can with the comps that we have. Um, we use the most recent sales. Okay. Um, you know, when home prices, let's say in February jumped ten percent, mm -hmm. let's just assume that that's what happened. Um, you know, appraisers did not have any sales that had, that had closed because yep. we have to rely primarily on closed sales. Closings, yeah. Um, so we use the most recent sales that we can and we make data sell time adjustments. I will say three or four months down the road, since this spike occurred 
it's easier for an appraiser to um, maybe support the sales price yeah. because we've got some we've got three or four months worth of homes that have closed at the yeah. higher prices. Yeah. So I'm not saying all all appraisers are going to come in at sales appraisals are going to come in at sales price, but it, it definitely is helps a little bit easier without a yeah. doubt. So yeah. it, it is you know it's it's not it, it hasn't been your typical you know steady four or five percent. Yeah, a straight line appreciation. It yeah. just really seemed to spike, and why you can, that's a whole nother. Yeah. Um, I always tell debate. people it's just such an, I love, I could do uh, commercials for free for the state of North Carolina and specifically our market. I just love it, love living right. here. So more and more people are coming and wanting to live here and are, are uh, catching on to the secret, and uh, there's just such a lack of inventory. So we need that to increase. So, um, how, how do you advise agents to realtors when they're pricing homes to sell? You know, do you, you know, how do you consider trends or neighborhood trends uh, when you're, when you're looking at, you know, well, settling on a list price? The first advice I would give them is you can't worry about the appraiser or the appraisal. I know a lot of times I've heard realtors say, well, we can, we can price it for this, but it's, it may not appraise. You can't worry about that. You know, do your work and price it for what you think, you know, the appropriate price is. Um, second of all, do the same things I just mentioned, you know, rely on the most um, recent sales and make data sale time adjustments mm. uh, to account for any appreciation. Mm. Um, there is a form, CC, we, we talked about, um, there's a form, could you hand me that yep. sheet over there? Yep. Um, after, this is great. This is really good. After <clears throat> the financial crisis of, let's say, 2008 and nine. Fannie Mae required us to include in our report um, a 1004 MC. It stands for market condition. And what a lot of you may not know is that matrix, the MLS system that we use, is, allows us to print this particular form. Um, what you can do is, let's say you're in a certain neighborhood, there's 50 sales within the past 12 months. Um, you highlight them all, go down to the bottom, hit print, and then hit uh, market conditions detailed report and, and at the end of the report you'll get this table and it separates the cells into three columns zero to three months four to six and seven to twelve if you look at the fifth line down i believe you'll see uh, median comparable sales prices 340 342 380 and you can see there is a trend home buy, home values are increasing mm. If you want to, you can take the difference between the two, uh, the first and last, um, which is 40,000 divided by 340. And I think that comes out to about 11.7%. Uh, the actual rate of uh, increase is actually a little bit higher because the seven to 12 month column includes sales that have sold closer to six months maybe than to 12 months. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something you can do with every neighborhood or market area you're in when you're trying to figure out how much to adjust for appreciation. Um, a second way to do it when you may, I don't, I'm not sure how you all are, arrive at your rate of appreciation is to use the CMA tab, which um, the quick CMA tab on MLS. Um, what you can do is pull up all the sales within a neighborhood uh, for the past 12, 12 months and print the quick CMA, look at the average price per square foot, mm. and then do the same thing going back 12 to 24 months, print that CMA report, and then you can compare the difference between the two price per square foot, um, let's say it's $5 uh, difference yeah. year over year, it's, in, it's increased $5 a square foot. You take that and you multiply it by the average size of the mm -hmm. home in the neighborhood. Let's say it's um, 2,000 square feet. 2,000 times five is $10,000. That's yeah. your... That's your hmm. um, uh, a good way to just kind of right. notate right. the... the the appreciation. That's great. That's super, super good information to share. Um, as far as the, you know, and I think you covered it there on appreciation and, you know, our appraisers, you know, are how are you addressing that uh, on your appraisals, especially, you know, from stuff that's gone in the last three to six months? Uh, I mean, I think that's probably, are you leaning into that report that you just showed or talked through? Is that what you're leaning into to somewhat get some comfort level as far as uh, value goes? Um, it, it just helps me arrive at a rate of appreciation that I can use and multiply that by um, the comparables. Yeah. Any, going back to data sell time adjustment, any comparable that had sold 
uh, or closed over 90 days ago, I will make a data sale time adjustment. Mm. And it depends on how many months back it went under contract. Um, let's say that uh, there's a question at the end, how much appreciation are appraisers adding to prices from six months ago? Well, let's say for simplicity's sake that home values are appreciating 12% yeah. uh, a year. That's 1% a month. Yep. So you go six months back, that's 6%. So yep. you, would time, you would multiply six times the total selling price of the comparable, and that's your date of sale time hmm. adjustment. Okay. If it's Interesting. 10, if it's 10 months back, 10%. Okay. I like it. Let's keep it in simple. Well, let's look at, uh, let's talk about some market questions because this is a hot topic. Um, and we got a ton of questions on this, you know, where you have literally how sits the market within 48 hours, you know, we have 30 offers, 20 to 25 of those offers are over list. Um, you know, are you able to take into account multiple offers, you know, if they're, if the property has been overbid as far as assigning value to home? Well, first of all, we do take it into consideration. There's top part of the appraisal form. There's a place where we analyze the contract and we analyze the listing. Mm -hmm. We report what the home's listed for, what it's under contract for. If it's under contract for considerably higher than what it's listed for, the underwriters are going to want an explanation. Sure. Um, in this market, most underwriters know what's going on. We've had a jump in value. Um, but we will still explain that for a listing agent, the home, there are multiple offers, which explains why the uh, contract price is higher than the list price. In years past, there may be some other things going on. Sometimes they include furnishings mm -hmm. in the sale, personal property. Sometimes they'll add a country club membership yeah. onto the price. They'll yeah. tack that on. And so the underwriters always want to know, you know, why. Um, but yeah, so we do, we do explain it. That's probably not what they're asking about, though, in the question. They probably want to know, well, let's say a house is under contract for 300,000. Yep. You had 10 people that wanted to buy it for that. The appraiser can only find comps to support 290. Yep. Well, how can that be? You know, and that goes back to the system we have in place. We're using trailing close, trailing data, close yeah. sales. It's not a perfect system. Yep. Um, you can call it conservative. You can call it flawed. I mean, you won't get it much argument from me, but that's the system we have in place. Yeah. Um, so we can't just say, well, under Mr. Underwriter, Mrs. Underwriter, I think it's worth 290, but because 10 people, we have multiple offers, 10 people that want to buy it for 300,000, I'm going to appraise it for 300,000. That's not going to fly. They want data. They yeah. want closed sales. Yes, we use pending sales, but because we, we don't know the exact final sales price that a pending sale is going to close for, the right. underwriters won't let us put much weight on it. yeah so I mean listen it, it, here's the other thing too and it's it's just it's easy to overlook but there's a there's a lending aspect to it I mean if the buyer's paying cash it's all good no big deal but when there's a bank that's lending money and then at the end of the day something happens because I when this when when the crash happened I can vividly remember talking to clients they were like hey I owned a house in Florida it was it's down 20 percent man I'm out I bailed on that because I'm not sticking around there and paying down on a note where I'm underwater 20%, screw that. And yeah. so what happens is they bounce, the bank takes that house back, and now all of a sudden they're left holding that, holding yeah. the loss, yeah. right? And, and it's just, so all this stuff, it all kind of, it's so, so, so tied together. And, um, and it's a hard thing to just, you know, it, yeah, it's yeah. in this market. It's like, well, yeah, good grief. We have, we have 20 people willing to pay for this. It's like, mm -hmm. well, yeah, but still at the end of the day, if something ever happened, and that particular buyer paid more than what the house is worth. And I wouldn't mind if you, this might be a good story oh, yeah. to share. That's right. I mentioned the other day, my father-in-law just sold his house after 30 some years. It's in a pretty big neighborhood. I won't use the exact numbers, but you know, the realtor wanted to list it for here. And we said, well, the comps are a little bit higher. And she said, okay, but no more than let's say 350. Um, got the first order in was a couple that had missed out yep. on several, uh, recent properties so they were eager to buy it and it seemed like every it seemed like in most cases the final contract price was 10 percent higher than the list price so they just just like a knee-jerk reaction offered 10 percent higher five percent due diligence so a hefty sum 
And it turned out there were only two offers. The house was a little dated. Yeah. So maybe that <laughs> limited how many people wanted to buy it. Um, there was one offer at list price and there was one offer, their offer 10% higher. So I guess the cautionary tale is, you know, don't just assume that, you know, if you're representing a buyer, maybe don't just assume that um, you know, in this market that they need to bid 10% over. Yeah. I mean, this was even before the realtor announced multiple offers, send in your highest and best offer by Sunday at six o'clock. They just right off the bat offer 10% higher. And of course, you know, my you're family, take it. they took that. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> well, in that so, case, I mean, and we got to share numbers because I've had these same conversations with uh, realtors that I work with. That delta could be fifty, sixty, seventy thousand yeah. dollars differential, and it's important because here's the thing: if if something a market correction happens in the future, and all of a sudden they're left holding the bag, and they're like, "Man, I just flushed seventy thousand dollars down the drain. I got to make a big boy decision on whether or not I want to keep this house or I want to bail and move on." Like, you know, those are real things. And so it is extremely challenging. I know uh, from, from the realtor standpoint on how to, you know, advise the clients on where to go in, what to offer. Cause it is such an emotional thing. You lose out on two or three and it's like, we ain't yep. missing this one. Right. This is the house I'm going to bid and I'm going to do whatever it takes to yep. win. And then the ego and pride and everything kicks in. It's very emotional. And so realtors are just such, it's such a hard thing to try and uh, to, to navigate through those waters with your client uh, because they see it, they want it and they've lost out and they're going to do what they need to. But again, there's that fine line on, on overbidding. Yeah. So, definitely. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so one of the other questions, you know, uh, how much do appraisers take into consideration the fact that a property had multiple offers above the asking price? Do you, you know, well, you know, again, we kind of just discussed it, but um, you know, multiple offers to me is, under the supply and demand yeah. market force. There's a lot of market forces that go in to determine the final contract price of right. the house. You know, you've got unemployment, low interest rates, stimulus mm -hmm. checks. I mean, we're in yeah. unprecedented times. Um, so we've got uh, moratoriums on evictions and foreclosures. Mm. So you've got that increases the supply. I'm sorry, that increases the demand. The demand, yeah. So uh, to me, that's just one of the many market forces that's already baked in to yeah. the contract price. So it's not like I'm going to make a line item adjust adjustment and say, well, yeah, 30 yeah. multiple offers, let's add a such and such value. Yeah. I mean, it's already in the price that we are trying to support using the best comparables we have. Yeah. And when you get an appraisal order, you, you do get a copy of the contract. So you know a price that you're trying to target, correct? 90%, 99% of the time. Now, Theoretically, it shouldn't matter. You know, yeah, we, you know, the numbers should come in, you know, uh, where they come in. Yeah, the contract price theoretically should not matter. But believe me, you know, we are trying to support. We know what's going on. We, we try to support, do everything we can within everybody. Every appraiser may have a different comfort yeah. level. So, yeah, know, we, you know, these are opinions um, and there, there is latitude to use certain comparables. Um, but Yes, we, we are aware. We analyze the uh, contract. We know what the contract price is. And yeah. most appraisers do their best to try to support it. Yeah, I mean, I will say there's one thing that, I, that I've got to plug here. That's one reason I'm super grateful to be at Fairway. Uh, we have an appraisal panel that we've worked with, and we have uh, hand-selected the appraisers that work alongside us. Mm -hmm. So whereas you go to these bigger banks, they have anybody can call. I want on your panel. They might have hundreds of appraisers that, you know, one might live in Hickory, but cover Charlotte. And then, you know, so it def definitely speaking to that quality that's, of the yeah, report. That's exactly right. And if I can share a story with you from a prior, uh, prior time I spoke to a group of realtors, um, one realtor expressed her frustration for appraisers that maybe weren't experienced. They were coming in from, you know, far away, a couple hours away, and she didn't understand that. And, and I said, yeah, unfortunately, there are national appraisal management companies that just hire any and everybody, they don't bet the appraisers. They'll often send it to whomever will do it for the least nice. amount of money. Yeah. <laughs> and she goes, well, what can we do about it? And I thought, well, I said, well, one thing you can do about it is steer your buyers to Fairway. Mm. And here's where I gave you an unsolicited uh, <laughs> plug, but, but exactly what you just said. Um, a lot of people don't know that Fairway has their own appraisal management company. And after, again, the financial crisis, 2008, nine, um, Everyone, all lenders kind of scrambled to sign up with whomever they could and they yeah. did, didn't really know what they were doing. Um, and you can, it was perfectly within their rights 
to start their own appraisal management company. And when they did that, they went around to all the branch managers, Jeff, Matt, Dan, yeah. uh, whomever, and said, give me your four, top three or four appraisers. We're going to add you to the panel, yep. uh, add them to the panel, which they did. So, you know, when you send a customer or a buyer to Fairway, it's no guarantee that you're going to, you know, yeah. get an appraisal that comes in at, at a contract price. But you're going to eliminate the risk of getting an inexperienced, maybe yeah. uh, appraiser from two hours away. Uh, yeah, that's huge. I mean, so, it does. It happens yeah. a lot. And you, you only get one shot at the appraisal yeah. in, in this day and age. Yeah. Um, you can't. Uh, in the past, if a lender didn't like one appraisal, yeah. they'd order another one. You can't, you can't do yeah. that anymore. Those days so are gone. You, might as well, you only have one <laughs> shot. So yeah, send your, send your, uh, I did not pay him for that, Bye. and uh, <laughs> that was very nice. Thank you very much. <laughs> right? Seriously. Uh, well, let's talk comps. You know, okay. let's switch gears. Right. Walk me through uh, how you select your comps. You know, especially in this unique. You know, if it's a unique property or in a, maybe a rural area, do right. you stay in the same zip code? Do you go further back in time? You know, further out mileage wise, as far as distance. You know. Yep. Walk me through the process of how you select the comps that you're going to okay. be using when you get an order. Again, and it's probably similar to what you know realtors do. We do we a lot of what we do overlaps. Um, obviously, the most simple example would be if we're in a big subdivision. You know, I'm going to pull up all the comps in the subdivision, and as long as I've got three, four, five that are similar, I'm probably got, not going to look out elsewhere mm -hmm. unless it has a particular feature like a pool, mm -hmm. and none of the recent comparables has a pool, then maybe I'll go outside to a comparable subdivision. Um, uh, unique properties, rural areas. Um, first of all, zip codes. Uh, I did read zip code in a couple of these questions that were submitted. I don't think I've ever searched by zip code. Good. Um, if I'm going outside of the subdivision, um, Matrix has a system where you can actually draw, you can either search a radius, mm -hmm. Or what I usually do is draw polygon. Okay. Um, you know, certain streets mm -hmm. that I know, you know, uh, incorporate a specific market area. Okay. Um, the reason I don't use zip codes, I think there's probably different market areas, different places where maybe lot values are considerably mm -hmm. different. So uh, uh, I've never used zip code. Not not saying you can't. Um, um, rural areas. Um, Usually, uh, well, let's talk about acreage. Yeah. Um, you can go, well, first of all, there's no rule of thumb how far out you can go. Yeah. There, there used to be, it used to be a myth. Well, you can only go one mile. You can only go 12 months. That's not true. The only rule is you use the best comparables available. And usually that's closest, same subdivision, um, same similarities. Um, when you're trying to find homes with acreage, um, you know, you can find a comp with, you know, sometimes you find a comp with two acres. So your subject has two acres, you find a comp with two acres and you're, you're tickled because you think it's a great comp. But, you know, in a, in a rural area, two acres here might not be the same acre, yeah. price per acre as uh, somewhere else. So you do have to pay attention to more um, hmm. things when it comes to making adjustments for or acreage, you can't just rely on the fact that they're the same size. Right. Um, that some could be in a flood zone. Mm. Some could have a power line running through it. Um, some could be in a different school district. That's yeah. what happened to me one time. I appraised a house in Matthews, and they had, I think, two acres, two or three acres. So I placed the most emphasis on finding homes with similar acreage. And I turned the report in, and the homeowner called me back or relayed the information through the loan officer. They said, well, only one of your comps is in the same school district. And she was exactly right. I overlooked that. And I think that's why I think, you know, when realtors are looking to price, um, come up with the, a list price, yeah. they put in a lot more hours into figuring out all the nuances and, and, and criteria of a property than, a, than an appraiser sometimes. So yeah. I'm probably preaching to the choir, but um, that's what I do in rural areas. Um, yeah, so one of the questions when you've got on here, where you know, <clears throat> so that was in regards to the question we're having. When there are no comps on, uh, that are like the property within a certain radius, do you go, you know, how do you handle that? And I know in here they, they mentioned, you know, do you go uh, further out as far as distance from the house? Do you go further back in time? 
Uh, is there, you know, search for properties that are maybe a little bit older or newer right. than the subject property, uh, you know, search right. properties that aren't quite, you know, aren't, aren't the same. And I've got a lot of people that'll call me back, you know, that'll, that'll call me, like, well, dude, look at this ranch, you know, and it's like, well, this is a three-story home or a two-story home, you know. Yeah, if, if, if I'm having a hard time finding comparables, I don't pay too much attention to design, one-story, two-story. If it's similar in square footage, similar in acreage, mm -hmm. similar in site value, Similar in age quality. Yeah, I might yeah. use. I might make a design adjustment. Maybe not. Um, one thing up here it says further back in time. Yes, um, if I'm in a subdivision where maybe there's no comps in the past twelve months, or maybe there's two or three that aren't really, I feel like good comps, or maybe let's say no comps. Um, the first thing I'll do is I'll go back two years, three okay. years. I want to find a comp in there just because there might be a neighborhood next door that seems comparable right but you never know there's nuances one might you know there's perceptions and nuances one might have a higher uh maybe site value or appeal market appeal that right. i might not know about so instead of just using three recent sales and not going back further and looking for comps you know in the subdivision that i can kind of just use as a guide right I, I can certainly use older comps and make a data sale time mm -hmm. adjustment so i always try to find use a comp in a subdivision yeah just as a starting basis yeah that's good to know i mean that's uh and that's another thing that we were talking about too and this is something i see uh in in certain areas where things aren't even going on the mls you know like literally they're they're they push up push something out to on facebook or to friends or to the next door app and next thing you know there's these houses that not that aren't even hitting mls that are going off market uh, so it's just, uh, you know, how do you, is there a way to account for that? Um, yes and no, you know, primarily we're going to try to use sales and MLS. Yeah. Um, I think there's a question, question further on in the segment where we're going to ask, uh, where you ask if it's, do you want realtors to give you information yeah. for sale by owners? hundred percent. Absolutely. Cool. If you're aware of any sales that may not be listed in MLS, MLS, MLS for whatever reason, please provide those uh, to us. Okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, as far as uh, how do you come up with a price per square foot? Um, <clears throat> okay. And do you use that? I, I do. And I generally use 40%, 40%, 50%. Um, hmm. I may use a higher percent of the subject or the comparables price per square foot, depending on uh, how high it is, $200, $300 a square foot, I might use something higher. 40% might work for most of you. Um, again, the last class uh, or the last group of realtors I spoke with, I kind of went around and asked everyone what they were using. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of surprised with the different answers I, uh, I heard. One person said they were using 100% mm. of the price per square foot, meaning if your comp sold for $100 a square foot, they were using $100 as their square footage adjustment. And to me, that's incorrect because there's so many things that go into price per square foot that are not really square footage. Right. For instance, land is probably the biggest, 25, 35% of, um, of, of homes, you know, total price is attributed to the land. You've also got garages, pools, screen porches, et cetera. Bathrooms, we make a separate bathroom adjustment in the equation. So if you want to use 100%, that's fine, but you may not want to make any other adjustments. Um, one gentleman said he used 50. And I said, 50%, that's great. Yeah, that probably works for you. He goes, no, $50. And I said, $50 for everything. He goes, yep. And again, that might work for his, the price point of homes he's, uh, selling for, yeah. um, if you get into a home, million dollar home that's selling for three hundred, you know, dollars. You've got homes that selling for three hundred dollars a square foot. Fifty dollars a square foot is probably going to be very inadequate. Right. That's inadequate. Yeah. 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 Hmm, interesting. Now I get this one a lot. Okay. Uh, uh, what about talk about some basements here? Because uh, you got a lot of houses that uh, that have finished basements. Uh, what value do you have a general idea or way of uh, establishing a value for basements? Does uh, does it make a difference for a walkout basement? I don't. Well, usually walkout basements, homes with walkout basements, a lot of times they're finished. Um, 
the quality yeah. is a similar manner as the up, the, maybe the upstairs, but not always. Uh, so I guess the answer is no. It don't make you know, it doesn't make too much of, of a difference. It depends on how extensive the renovation or the quality. Yeah, uh, is the quality is it a semi-finished basement, which right. we've all seen, or is it finished just like you know as nice as the upstairs? Um, hmm. If you want a dollar, if you want me to throw out a dollar amount, I sometimes use, and I've actually kind of use this from, I obtained this adjustment from what builders are charging for hmm. new construction. Sometimes $30 a square foot for unfinished basements, maybe 60. Okay. Um, that's what I'm seeing as far as new construction. So that's kind of what I use. As a baseline. Uh, hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Again, I would like just to make a, a warning about, you know, a lot of these groups that I speak with, um, you know, the main thing they want to know is, well, how much do you give for a screen porch? How much do you give for a pool? How much do you give for a bathroom or an extra garage? And there's no one size fits all adjustment. Um, it depends on the market. Yeah. Depend, you know, there's no two, are, I mean, are all screen porches alike? Yeah. I mean, no. you could have an inexpensive one, you could have an elaborate one. So um, there are ways to, you know, there's, you know, we're not supposed to use rule of thumb. Right. adjustments, which means just, uh, you know, something we pull out of our head. Um, it's been the a point of emphasis for appraisal boards for the past 10 years that uh, a lot of appraisers are being reprimanded for not having document supporting documentation in their work file, which means we're supposed to have supporting docs in our work file for every adjustment we make. Mm. And wow. I can tell you, if we did that, it would take, you know, two or three days to put together a report and the whole industry would <laughs> a screeching halt. But uh, hmm. how we go about that is we put a statement in there, or I do, um, you know, I'll, I'll say, well, this adjustment is based on that. This adjustment is based on that. All other adjustments based on historical match care analysis. It means I didn't, maybe not, maybe I didn't gather the data for every adjustment, but I have in the past. Yeah. I've, I've analyzed and extracted adjustments from data, um, and I have it in other work files. Um, so hmm. I always like to, you know, just there's not a one size fits that. all. It, it, yeah. Exactly. So no, I've had those conversations where clients are like, well, did I just put a $75,000 deck on my house? Like, and then uh, you see the comps, it's like, I, it's beautiful. Right. But like this other house that had a deck, I mean, look at it. I mean, it's just, I mean, it, it probably was 200,000. Like, come yeah. on, like, let's be real. It's just, it's a, it's a difficult thing to navigate, yeah. you know? It's like, yeah, it's like patios. You can have just the builder slab. Yeah, 10, 12 by 12, or you can have a yeah elaborate, you know, custom paver stone yeah. patio with fireplace. And so yeah, no two patios are alike. Yeah. So it just, you know, use common sense and, and try to find match pair analysis. For sure. I, I'm not sure how, you know, that's how appraisers are taught to yeah. make adjustments. I'm not sure how realtors are taught mm. in mm. their education. So what about garages, you know? So we have a lot of questions on this where you have a client that's selling their house, they put in, um, you know, a detached two car, three car garage with an apartment over top, you know, um, is there a difference in value that's given, uh, you know, for, for detached garage with apartments above, how do you go about doing that? You know, and atypical features like that, it's just, you know, it's hard. Yeah, you know, it's hard. Um, it's going to be, you know, ideally you find a match pair analysis. Um, yeah. You find a house and then you find a house with a gar garage with an you know, apartment upstairs and yeah. you adjust for everything else and whatever's left, that's the value you give the apartment, you know, the yeah. apartment or extra living the area. The extra living area. Um, again, there's, you know, stick built versus aluminum garages. It's just. Yeah. It's all know, in the it, comps it, are there. Yeah. Some, some adjustments are just, you know, just going to, you know, they might be impossible to find enough data to really come up with a meaningful uh, adjustment. Yeah. Yeah. So um, this is another question that I get a lot. Okay. Cause you know, people were uh, prior to the market, you know, prior to this insanity um, you know, I had people that veterans, one of the best um, things that's provided to them when they return home is uh, is a VA loan. Uh, the VA option where it's a hundred percent loan where I've got clients that, that are like, Hey, Yes, I could do a conventional loan and put 20, 30% down, but I'd rather go VA because it's a better loan for me and I'd rather do this. Or, you know, maybe it's an FHA loan. Is, is there a different valuation system for like a government loan, VA, FHA, USDA versus conventional 
Um, is there a different valuation system or is it the same? Well, the basic way we value properties remains the same. FHA requires us to do what I call a mini home inspection, the flush toilets, make sure all the electrical, you know, mechanical systems are working, make sure um, there's not any safety issues, peeling paint, make sure there's no you know, broken windows, um, hmm. et cetera. So, so if, there's, if there's peeling paint, sorry to interrupt you, but yeah. like if there's peeling paint or maybe peeling paint on, a, on a, a garage out back, like is that with a government loan, uh, with a government appraisal, does that have to be scraped, sanded, and repainted if, prior if, to yeah. close? If the house was built before a certain date, I think it's 1978. Okay. Uh, if there's any peeling paint, they assume the worst. Got it. it could be lead-based paint, yep. which is a safety issue. So they want uh, those buyer that, protection that on some level. Yeah, that remediated. Um, so that's the main difference between FHA and conventional. Just our level of inspection. It's more you can think of it in terms of a mini home inspection. Okay. Whereas we don't. Um, we do. And for conventional, we assume all of the mechanical systems are working operational. Uh, VA loan. I cannot speak to. Of, I do not. I'm not. Do not appraise or VA loans. Um, I think there's only a handful of appraisers, from what I understand, um, that do. I would imagine they're similar. It's more similar to FHA, but do not okay. know. Yeah. Okay. Good stuff. Um, all right. So this has been fantastic. Seriously, thank you for yeah. for carving Thanks some for time. Me. One thing that I, I need to, I definitely need to add here. Um, because this, at the end of the day, look, we're all trying to come alongside sellers that want to sell buyers that want to buy. Um, you know, I've had, a, I've had agents that I've worked with that, that I work with now. They're like, you know, I don't even, you know, what should I do? Should I talk to the appraiser? What should, you know, what should I provide them as an, you know, as the appraiser, do you appreciate it when, you know, when realtors give you a breakdown of upgrades, uh, costs associated with the upgrades, uh, would you prefer having that, not having it? Also, um, if they're aware of homes, like we had talked about earlier that have sold off market, mm -hmm. that they have the documentation on, um, do you want us, do you want them to share that information with you and how, you know, how can we come alongside you, the appraiser and, and the clients to help support the value? Right. Um, as we talked about before, yes, if you're aware of any off market sales, maybe Zillow for sale by owner, maybe it just sold before it went on the market and they don't take the time to put it in MLS. Yes. We want to know about those sales. Um, as far as a breakdown of upgrades and costs. Definitely, uh, a lot of appraisers, a lot of realtors will leave a packet for the appraisers and that's very much welcome and appreciated. Um, I will say though, if you're just gonna leave, print out some cells that are in MLS and staple them together and leave them, that's not really gonna do us much good. Um, what I would, what we would prefer, what really I found, find helpful is if you, you know, make little notes on each one. Um, you know, this one was in a flood zone. This one had power lines running through the property. Uh, maybe some nuances about the neighborhood or that particular sale that we're not aware of. And we may not take enough time to find out that happens. Um, if it's, you know, if there's 10 sales in the neighborhood and two of them are distress sales, hmm. I don't know that you need to print those and explain why they sold that low because the appraiser is probably not going to use them to begin with. Okay. Um, as far as upgrades, um, yeah, a lot of, you know, a lot of you already, already put like a bullet point, um, or a list of upgrades, um, for appraisal, for what's beneficial to appraisers, if you can add maybe the, you know, the cost and the date, up, and the date. yeah, hmm. the date, um, that really helps us out a lot. Um, yeah, but yeah, we welcome any and all information. Yeah. Um, so it's like, Hey, put a new roof in. It was sixteen thousand dollars. This was done on you know October of twenty twenty. Like specifically yeah. line item each yeah. one. Okay. Exactly. It, you know anything we can, especially when you know, someone's refinancing a house or or if they're flipping a house kind of after a couple of years. It sold for two hundred thousand. Now it's selling for four hundred thousand. Mm. The more we can document, you know, we have to explain. Well, yeah, this house sold two years ago. The underwriter might want to know. Well, how, how did it double in value? Right. So we want to be able to document all the improvements. Yeah. And we'll, we will type them out. Love we'll it. Type, yeah. So, That's awesome. Yep. So you're cool with them uh, sharing that information with you? Yep. Perfect. 100%. Good to really know. Really appreciate it. Okay. Well, um, 
we're, we're coming up on time. We wanted to live a little bit of a buffer for some Q and A's. Okay. Um, let's see. Kelly Smith's got a question. If you have enough comps to support an appraisal within the past 30 days in a neighborhood, do you have to go back 12 months? Great question. Uh, absolutely not. Um, you know, I typically search um, just a, a typical time frame when I first search for comparables inside a subdivision, I'll plug in you know, zero to 12 months, but um, I will definitely use the most recent sales. Okay. Uh, and that's what I've, you know, I've been, and it's again, recently, I don't know if it's, it's a lot, but are just the fact that we've had, we're two or three months uh, into this recent ap appreciation spike. Um, I can often find three comps that have sold within the past three months. So awesome. Uh, typically don't make a data sell time adjustment to those. Okay. So, yes. That's awesome. Yeah. To know. Great question. Let's see. All right. When you use a pending sale, this is from Lee Bryant. Uh, do you use the list price number in the analysis? We do. Yep. That's the only price that we're privy to, you know, I don't think the, uh, any of the agents are allowed to disclose what the contract price is to anyone until it closes. Okay. So we have to use the pending or the list, list price. And that's one reason why the underwriters don't let us put too much weight on those because you don't, you don't ever know. I mean, in this market, yeah, they're, it's probably going to be five, five or 10% higher, yeah. but in other markets, it might be 10% lower. Yeah. So that's why they don't put a lot of uh, yeah. as much weight on a pending sale as a closed sale. Yeah. One thing I'll, I'll, I'll mention, because this actually happened to me uh, recently, um, where I had a client that was wanting to list his house. He's wanting to buy new. Uh, and he and his wife, looked. there was two homes that were literally just went on the market. He contacted the seller. He actually even knocked on their door. He's like, look, I'm looking, I'm thinking about selling my house. You know, I'm sure your house will sell quickly. And it sure enough, it did. It went under contract and they waited the 30 days for that house, those two houses to sell. Oh, so yeah. now they're comps, right? And so then he listed and then boom, he got top dollar because he was patient and got those two extra comps that sold higher in the subdivision. Yep. Um, so, so one quick question, if I have a, so, so the agent gets a house under contract or, you know, they agree to a price, mm -hmm. right? So contract comes in, we send the order to our appraisal management company. It gets assigned to you. Right. You go do the order on the date of like, based on the date of, so if you did that the appraisal today, it would be based on, based on comps that were available on June 2nd. Now, let's say you note a listing that, uh, that, that's a pending sale that's under contract and it closes in the 30 day contract, 45 day contract, you know, like during the, during the process of the, con you know, of the loan getting executed okay. before closing. Right. And so now all of a sudden, we have an extra comp that could support higher value. If that how if that appraisal comes in low, can we go? Can we add that comp after the fact? Is it, that it frowned would, upon? Well, it would be up to the lending guidelines. Um, we could certainly it would be we would treat it as a new assignment. Okay. We would uh, we would do a new appraisal on the new updated effective date. Yep. After the pending sale had closed. Okay. So it would be up to the lender whether or not they would be willing to order a second appraisal. Okay. So it would be basically a whole new appraisal. We would treat it as a new assignment. Yeah. You know, we've completed the other assignment. Got it. That was on that date. Got it. Now we're completing a new appraisal on a more yeah. recent date. Yeah. So there's, there's nothing, there's nothing unethical or wrong from an appraiser standpoint to do that. We so would just curious. treat it as a new assignment. Um, that would be, yeah. is that something you guys could well, do or? I, I, I've done, done it. Done we, it. Yeah. we have done it before. And I'll be, I'll be honest, it, it's, you know, it's saved a deal. You know what I'm saying? Where yeah. it came in, it appraised under, and then there's another comp that sold that really anchored the, the, the yeah. home value. And so we were able to add that comp. It took a little bit longer, so we had to extend it, but, yeah. uh, but it worked, you know? So, yeah. all right. Daniel Edwards has got a great question here. Do appraisers call pending homes to find out anything about them? Can they ask a pending sale? what it will close for if it is closing the day after your report uh, and you can't use it, you know, as a comp, that's a great question. Yep. So um, I think, I think a real, and real, you guys know this better than I do, but I think a realtor can disclose maybe or tell the appraiser when it's scheduled to close. That's not anything confidential. I don't think they're allowed to tell anyone what the contract price is. Okay. Okay. And, until it closes. Until it closes. Yeah. Yeah, because that's her, her uh, she actually just had an appraiser 
uh, appraisal for 214 contract price that was uh, you know was 260 ordered another appraisal when it came in at 252 you know crazy difference because you know the one pending sale couldn't be used and then it closed the day after the appraiser went out so and that's that's kind of referencing what what, what happened to us so um, yeah hey, can I can I ask you something um, have they lifted the ban on foreclosures can a lender initiate foreclosure proceeding now or is that still is there still a nationwide ban on those yeah to my knowledge i I'm, i don't think that we yeah. can because this spike and you know this spike in home values kind of caught me off guard maybe yeah. a lot of people i was thinking well as soon as they lift i was afraid not hoping but i was afraid that once they start um allowing foreclosures and evictions that it would cause Women again work. increase in supply and yeah. that might uh, lower values a little bit probably nothing as drastic as we saw in 2008 or yeah. nine, but, um, and I guess it still could happen. I, you know, I'm not hoping that, that but, um, yeah. but, but you have this inflation that yeah. that's causing the homes to go up lumber prices. So yeah. you've got a lot of mm. factors that are, or weighing in on it. Yeah. For so. sure. Interesting. No, I don't know the answer to that. Okay. So. Well, sorry to put you on the spot. No, 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 not at all. Um, Kelly Smith's got a question. Okay. Uh, so she's in the Raleigh market. And the listing price is the floor. Uh, if you offer the floor, your offer is thrown out first. You know, would appraisers consider uh, consider it uh, if it went multiple offers prior to ever being shown? Was it uh, was just a bidding war where they had 13 offers the first day? Uh, it was a coming soon status. Home was priced appropriately. In short, does it make a difference if the home was shown or in coming soon status when the home went with multiple offers? You know, all of that, again, goes back to, you know, the final contract price. The final contract price takes into all those factors. Yeah. So it's not that appraisers don't really need to know any of that. Hmm. Um, you know, well, was it coming soon? Was it pending? Was it on the market for a while? Hmm. Um, were there multiple offers? Yeah. Um, I know it seemed, you know, on, to some or to realtors, you know, it, it matters. And it seems like that should affect, yeah. um, you know, the appraised value, but um, again, there's only one contract price. We know what it is. We know the factors out there affecting the market. Right. We're going to find the best comparables we can to support that number. Yeah. So it doesn't hurt to us to document all of those things that they mentioned yeah. because it doesn't matter. It's not going to matter to the underwriter. Yeah. You know, they want to see you know comp. Yeah. They want to see closed sales. Yeah. Yeah. Good. And, good. Uh, great question there. So, um, all right, Cindy uh, Snyder asked a question. What do you give for a pool or <laughs> updated bathroom slash kitchen? Yeah, well, it, it, you know, it depends. Um, it, it goes back to what I said before. Um, you know, there's no one size fits all adjustment. You know, it depends on how nice the pool is. It depends on the price point of the neighborhood. So, you know, I'm just not comfortable giving out you know, yeah. throwing out numbers. Yeah, um, 50 grand for a pool. Like that doesn't. Well, they, you know, I think the pool is a good example of where cost doesn't equal market value. Right, a lot of people will spend yeah. $80,000 for a pool. It probably doesn't add that. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you're obviously uh, more, you get more return for your money on kitchens and bathrooms, I think. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I'm not comfortable throwing out a number. What I would do is go back, use match pair analysis, pull up, you know, homes in the neighborhood with pools, without pools, mm -hmm. try to, try to isolate, you know, two cells that are similar in a lot of ways, make adjustments, and then whatever is left over, that's your pull adjustment. Hmm. Same way with a home updated and not updated. Yeah. You know, you might have two identical homes, and then maybe they sold for $30,000 difference. Yeah. Same, you know, within the same month, same yeah. size. Um, one was updated, one was not. Well, there's your adjustment. Yeah, that's 000. great. So that's um, a, a, there, there's not a one size fits all, you know, adjustment for those items oh well, it's an emotional thing because i know you know when you have people that are sinking hundreds of thousands of dollars into their back away you know backyard yeah. oasis they want they want top dollar for it and you know it's yeah. hard not to compare one to the other yeah. so uh, you know we'll say it might be informative but you know a lot of homeowners or homeowners and realtors that they ask me well we're thinking about adding on a sunroom i'm not a big addition of you know sunroom well i'm not a, a big addition of a big expand renovation yeah. like that. I don't think you get you know, your money back as yeah. much, but you know, but if, if they're going to stay there for you know, yeah. 10 years, 15 years, and they want the extra space and 
you know, same way with the pool. Yeah. You know, if, if you're going to enjoy it, if it's something that's high on your list, then, mm. then do it. Um, but anyway. Go back up there, uh, if you don't mind, CC. There was another question from Vito. When looking at waterfront homes, how much value or difference is put into the fact that some homes are open water views uh, with dock and others that are in a cove, you know, with a dock not open water view? Right. I mean, waterfront lots are like snowflakes, you know, no, no two are alike. Yeah. Some are great views, some are back in a cove. Um, again, you can, one way to do it is look at the tax values, see how the tax values of the lots uh, differ okay. um, as a guide. And then also, again, match pair analysis. Okay. You know, try to find two homes that are alike and it may take longer, but try, try to find two homes that are alike in a lot of ways, make adjustments and then what, uh, whatever left over might be your difference between a cove lot and a main channel lot. Cool. Well, listen, this is, what's that? June 30th. June 30th. Thank you. Thank you. So okay. we just had to, uh, William just looked that up. June 30th is when that uh, moratorium ends on the foreclosure. So definitely, um, I mean, no doubt that's going to add inventory. So, um, all right. Well, listen, I thank, cannot thank you all enough. I know um, I've got to plug this. We're doing this. Hopefully you're getting some good value on these things. Uh, I actually had a real estate agent reach out to me. Uh, and, and, and said, hey man, listen, that, that class you did a couple months ago where uh, you talked about the 59 day lease back option, I specifically went out, looked in my database, I saw homes that are for clients that I had worked with where they had pretty massive appreciation and called and, and, and checked in on them and specifically uh, talked through you know, what we could do and the way we could structure it on being able to, hey, we're going to sell your house. We're going to do a lease back to where you could probably let's stay in here for free for 59 days. You get the money. We have basically 90 days from when we write that contract to closing to where you can go. We can go find your house. But now you've got a loaded gun. You've got to, you don't, we don't have to go in, you know, not contingent because that's always a, a source of stress where the client's like, I don't want to be homeless, man. I got too much stuff going on. I don't want to be homeless. So ultimately, he's like, hey, I got two clients from that. So two sales and two buys. So I got four transactions from that idea. So my hope is that these classes that we're doing um, are helping. It's helping bring value. It's, it, that's the whole intent of this. John, I, thank you so much. Seriously, this has me. been yep. great. Uh, and you're gonna, we're going to continue to do these classes monthly. And I uh, would love for you to continue to join, tell some friends. And honestly, uh, if you are um, currently working with us at, at Fairway, uh, please reach out to the, the loan officer that you're working with because the whole point of this is to try and iron, you know, iron sharpens iron and, uh, and, and there's just value in us all sharing ideas, best practices on how to go compete and win in this, uh, in this crazy market. So seriously, thank you all so much uh, for joining us today and I uh, look forward to our next, uh, next time.